Welcome back to the Media 7 Anzac Special. We say lest we forget, but sometimes it helps to be reminded. Sam Mulgrew with the source. The Wednesday just passed marks the 97th year since New Zealand and Australian troops landed at Anzac Cove under heavy fire. The Gallipoli campaign was the Anzac's first major involvement in the Great War in nine gruesome months, 2,721 Kiwis, around a third of those who landed, had died. And almost all the rest were badly injured. Top Kiwi journalist, official war correspondent for 85 newspapers, Malcolm Ross, reported alongside the men in all the major theatres of World War I. He reported from Gallipoli for six months. The Allies' grand plan was to take Gallipoli, the Dardanelles Straits and Istanbul so war supplies could be sent to their Russian allies via the Black Sea. It failed utterly. It was designed and tirelessly endorsed by the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill. He then stepped out of politics to lead his regiment on the Western Front. 120,000, or 42% of New Zealand's military-aged men, enlisted to fight, in a population of just over 1 million people. More than 2,000 of them were Māori, 450 Pacific Islanders. And at its conclusion, the Great War had claimed the lives of more than 18,500 New Zealanders. Nearly 50,000 more were wounded, Mostly, the casualties occurred at the Western Front, but 2,600 men, many of them with families, refused conscription and faced jail and loss of voting rights for objecting. This collection is the Australian official account of the war, but the New Zealand government refused to endorse a Kiwi official history until now. Sam Mulgrew there. Now, given the way that New Zealand's role in World War I has shaped our national identity, it is remarkable that, as Sam Mulgrew noted, there has never been an official history of our war, until now. Last year, the government announced funding for the centenary history of New Zealand and the First World War, which will eventually extend to ten volumes. With me now is the man tasked with making that happen, Massey University historian Glyn Harper. Welcome, Glyn. Thank you. So, in official history, what took so long? Um, well, it certainly has taken a long time, and you're quite correct in the fact that we don't have an official history. Um, and when you compare that with the 12 volumes of what the Australians did at the time, it is a sad omission. Um, I do need to uh, correct you, though, it's not actually an official history. Um, it is going to be the centenary history. It's being largely led by Massey University, my institution, but we're also partnering with the New Zealand Defence Force and the RSA, and with some considerable support from culture and heritage. And we are looking at producing around 10, maybe 12 volumes. It seems to get larger and larger as people say, oh, you haven't thought about this, or you should think about that. But what we are trying to do is to capture in these volumes the full story of New Zealand's involvement, and it's a pretty big story, and you know it is time that we told it. Are there going to be elements of that story that surprise us? Are there things... That, will it lead us to reassess what we think we know about that war? Absolutely. We'll be able to use the latest evidence that, that's being produced, and there's stuff coming out of archives around the world every day. We'll be able to use German sources, which are now available in translation. We want to take a fresh look at this conflict because it is pivotal in our history, and we think it's timely now to do so. What do you what do you expect to learn from the German sources uh, that, that, that you won't get from the, from the local records? Well, we'll be able to get what they actually thought of New Zealanders and whether they actually were able to identify them as being different from British soldiers or Australian soldiers. We'll be able to get um, how they were suffering as, as a result of some of our actions. Um, we'll be able to get, for example, what they thought of the Battle of Passchendaele, which is our worst disaster and an attack really that shouldn't have gone ahead. It'd be interesting to get their views on on what they thought of things like that. How much of it do you expect to come from war correspondents, people like Malcolm Ross, who was mentioned in that track? Um, a fair bit. We will certainly have to look at Ross's records. We'll also have to look at other war correspondents as well, like, Ch like Charles Bean and several others. We'll also look at some of the British war correspondents. But we want to cast the net fairly widely, and, and this is why it's going to be such a big project. A lot of material pertaining to New Zealand is actually available on Australian sources in their archives in Canberra and also available at the, uh, at the public record office in the UK and at several universities around the UK as well. 
How much of this did New Zealanders know at the time and in the decades that followed? Was, was there a lot that was kept from people? I think, yeah, there was a lot kept from people. I mean, we produced uh, not an official history, but a popular history, um, a couple of which are very good, um, some of which aren't quite so good. Um, the casualty figures always seem to me to be a bit fudged, you know, and they're, they're not actually clear sometimes about what the actual casualties were, and they always seem to be a bit understated. Um, so I think there'll be things like, you know, knowing exactly how many people were killed on a certain day or in a certain action, you know, these are important things to know, but also looking at what people were writing in their diaries and letters, writing back home to families, what people back home uh, thought about the war. And uh, one volume, which is going to be critical because we haven't done it before, is a detailed volume on the home front. And we want to know what New Zealand communities at the time were experiencing, what they were thinking about the war, how it was impacting on them. There are some pretty big stories to be told here. When you say we, who are you talking about? Because you, you've got 10 to 12 volumes to produce in the next two years for the uh -huh. centenary. Uh -huh. You're not going to do that on your own. No, yeah. Absolutely not. No, I'm going to do the first volume, which is probably going to be called Johnny e and Z, the history of the New Zealand soldier during the First World War. But we will assemble a team of historians, uh, made up of historians from the New Zealand Defence Force, from Culture and Heritage, and we'll also contract out historians as, as well. And we'll hope to get you know these uh, 10 volumes and maybe 12 volumes produced over the time of the centenary. We'll start the first one coming out about 2015, hopefully in time for Anzac Day that year, because that'll be a, that'll be a pretty big one. Um, and then we'll try and roll out volume. Uh, consecutively each year after that until hopefully by 2019 we've got the 10 or 12 volumes, whatever it is, produced. Who's the work going to be for? Is, it, is this going to be a, a book that ordinary people can read? Absolutely, and, and what we want to get in these books are the, the quality of being scholarly but accessible. We're aiming them at the general public and we're writing these books to be read. We want the uh, general New Zealander who might not have a, a detailed knowledge of military history but knows a little bit about the, the past to pick it up, read it, enjoy the read but also learn a lot from it as well. So scholarly and accessible are the, are the two qualities we're aspiring to achieve. It strikes me this is in some respects must be a, a fairly daunting job because it's not just our war, it's the war that defined who we were. Absolutely, it's a, it's a very big task and uh, you're, you're absolutely right, this is our first uh, time that we're involved in a war of this scale for that length of time with so many people and it does start to define us as a nation, it is a pivotal part of our military heritage and it is quite daunting because one thing we don't have on our side is time. Um, the centenary is less than three years away now and um, we want to start getting these stories and the research done now so that we have these volumes coming out during the centenary um, as, as it starts to it starts to happen. Well, Glenn Harper, congratulations on the job and best of luck with it too. Thank I look you forward much. to it. Thank you, Russell. Now, finally, the Dominion Post on Saturday gave this missive pride of place on its letters page. The letter endorses the racist, paranoid philosophy of Norwegian mass murderer Anders Breivik and declares that hardline measures will be required in all countries to counter the threat of fundamental Islam. But, quote, Sadly, Breivik just chose a tragic and wrong way to express his fears, which is a bit like saying Hitler had the right idea, but sadly he didn't stop at Poland. We put such an analogy to the Don Post letters editor, Sue Carty, who said the paper would print that letter too. Indeed, people died for that right. We're just wondering about the responsibility part. And that's our show. Thanks to John Stevenson and Glenn Harper, and to you for watching. We'll be back with Media 7 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>